So you see, what I don't understand is why I have to go through all this pain. But when I do see something that I don't agree with, I become addicted to try and answer what is the truth. And today I'm going to talk about some of the ideas that, have, that I've focused on. And they, they come in many different topics, but, uh, and you can see they cover medical problems in marathon runners, rugby injuries, RF rugby players overplayed, something about nutrition, should we be eating carbohydrates or should we be eating fats, and particularly what regulates our exercise performance. And then, is it possible to swim at the North Pole at minus 1.8 degrees centigrade in a speedo? So, <laughs> so I'm going to talk about those questions. And I'm going to begin by the very first question that ever came to me as a scientist was, are marathon runners immune to heart disease? And this was a theory developed by a, Canadian, by a California pathologist. And he said on the basis of any contrary evidence, it looked like if you ran a marathon, you'd never have a heart attack. So, I mean, I knew that was absolutely bogus, but to prove it was rather more difficult. And at the, at the time, in the 1970s, this was the Bible of running. It was written by James Fix, and he described in length the whole hypothesis. And tragically, seven years after this picture was taken, Jim Fix died of a heart attack while running. But by then, we'd in fact already shown that, that it was possible for people to have heart disease. So we looked for, when we saw reports of people dying from dying in marathon races, we would go and collect their hearts and we would examine them. And eventually we found the evidence, and so we published a paper in the New England Journal of Medicine showing that there were runners who had disease, and the disease here is, this is coronary artery disease, in which there's obstruction of the coronary arteries causing heart attacks, and we were able to show that this man had had a heart attack whilst he was running the marathon. So that was published, and so that disproved it. That, that's obviously very easy to do. It's easy to find a few cases that disprove a, a theory. The next one that really got, I got involved with is in the 1980s was, should we be drinking more or less during exercise? And at the time, in the 1960s, it was held that actually if you drank during exercise, that wasn't a very good idea. And Abibi Bakila, who was the first African runner to, to win two Olympic gold medals in the 1960 and 1964 Olympic marathons, he ran both races without drinking anything. And uh, that was what runners did in those days. And then all of a sudden, in the 1960s and 70s, things changed, and we were told that if you didn't drink enough, you were going to die during exercise. And I became interested in why was that, why was that the case. And the moment, the epiphanous moment, occurred in 1981, in the 1st of June, 1981, when an athlete started the Comrades Marathon in Durban, and she reached 70 kilometers, and her husband withdrew her from the race because she didn't recognize him. And he felt that wasn't a good idea, so she was. <laughs> and he then, he took her for medical care, and in short order, within two hours, she was unconscious, having epileptic seizures and she had to be taken back to hospital in Durban. And when she was admitted to hospital, this, she became the first case of this condition, which a long name, we don't need to understand what it is at the moment. But here's her chest x-ray, and this shows she's got fluid in the lungs, and it took five days later before the, the fluid had gone out of her lungs. But this is what happened, really happened, was her blood sodium concentration, which should normally be at 140, and is tightly regulated. It's one of the most regulated features of the body had dropped to 114. That's heroically wrong. Something has gone tragically wrong. And she asked me what had happened, and I said, we have absolutely no idea. And it was the first case in the world, so we had no idea. Over the next four or five years, we picked up a couple more cases and worked out that they probably had overdrunk, and that, that in other words, they drank too much during exercise. And then at the 1988 Comrades Marathon, we could prove it by hospitalizing eight people who were really sick with this condition and following them during recovery. And we were able to show that they all passed an excess of fluid during recovery. And so this athlete here passed six liters of fluid extra during recovery. And that she had dropped her blood sodium concentration to a very low level. And you can see that there was a nice relationship. So the more you overdrank, the lower your sodium and the sicker you were. And we published that in 1991 and thought that's the end of the problem. We, cu we, we cured the problem. We know what caused it. It's overdrinking. 
And we thought the problem would go away. But unfortunately, at the same time that we were doing that, industry had come along and said, no, actually, the more you drink, the better. So there's an advert in the 2000s, sorry, there was an advert shown there saying that not only must you drink, but you must drink heroically during exercise. This is 1.2 liters per hour, or your performance will suffer. And we predicted what would happen. We predicted this would happen. And this is the incidence of this condition, the cumulative incidence of this condition, where it never existed before 1981, never existed. There were a total of 1,600 cases in the medical literature. Not, this is not all cases, because many were not uh, recognized. And tragically, there were 12 deaths, all completely avoidable. And uh, so what happened was the sports drink industry came along then, and then they influenced the official drinking guidelines drawn up by official bodies. And th those promoted over drinking. Then a lady died in the Boston Marathon in 2002. And in 2003, I was invited by two organizations to produce drinking, alternate drinking guidelines, which promoted drinking to thirst. And that finally has now been accepted, that that is the way we should be we're drinking. But you can see what the cost of that a disease that was never existed came along. And uh, finally, the book written about the whole so sorry 30-year saga was released recently. And what I was able to show, that the science of hydration is utterly bogus. There is no science to it. It was dreamed up by marketers to sell product. And that'll come back to that point in due course. The next question that really has intrigued me was, do muscles regulate exercise performance, or is it something else? And it's really interesting in sport that you see such close finishes. And this was the 2000, the 2000 10,000 meter in, two, in the year 2000. And you can see that Haile Gebri Selassie has won this race by a few inches. And it's a race that goes on for 25 minutes. So how can a 25 minute race come down to a few, few, a few centimeters? And the argument is that the reason why the athlete comes second is because his muscles have got too much lactic acid and that causes him trouble. So the athlete who comes second, his heart's unable to pump enough blood to his muscles, so they become anaerobic, and as a consequence, they produce lactic acid, which you all learnt in biology, causes muscle poisoning and stiffness, and everything that goes wrong in sport is related to this terrible product, lactic acid. And over time, it took us a few years, but we realized this model can't be right, it can't be true, for a very simple reason, that it's brainless. And so fatigue is, in this model is caused exclusively by the failing muscles. So the brain can't influence your performance. So what you think is utterly, completely irrelevant. And all of you know that's rubbish, because motivation must have a role in some way in sporting performance. So we did a lot of research. And, and then, finally, the, we realized what the evidence was. And it, again, it just takes one insight to, to see these things. This is Haile Gebri Selassie running the 10,000 meters. And this is his average pace for each kilometer. And what do you notice? He runs the fastest the last kilometer. But how can that be? How can he run his fastest when he's the most fatigued? And all that tells you is that fatigue, as we describe, it's got nothing to do with the physical state of your body because he's performed much better when his, when his muscles are the most tired. So therefore, we worked out that fatigue is purely an emotion. It's what your brain is making up. It's completely fallacious emotional information that your brain uses to make sure you don't die during exercise. <laughs> <laughs> And so we eventually came up with this model, the central governor model of exercise, which originally was criticized. When we proposed it in 1996, people said, you're mad. How can it possibly be true? I'm glad to say that there are multiple Olympic athletes at this very moment training according to this model and acknowledging it, that they are now training because they understand performance. And what this model says simply is that the brain regulates your muscle performance, and that feeds back to your brain. And then there are other factors, like motivational factors, and I see my time's running, so I'm going to have to go a bit quickly, that there are a whole bunch of factors that influence your brain. And then you start exercise at a, different, at a particular work rate, 
uh, which is different depending on how far the activity is. You always have reserve. You always finish with the, you, you could always exercise harder. There's always an end spurt. And finally, there's always feedback to the brain. So that's the way the system works. And uh, it, as I've indicated, it's now becoming accepted. The next question, is it possible to swim one kilometer at this, at minus 1.8 degrees and only a speedo? And the person who asked me that question was Lewis Pugh. And we, in just approximately five, five years ago, traveled to the North Pole to, to have him swim one kilometer. And my question, I had to make sure he returned alive. And it all began when he said, can I swim around the Cape Peninsula? And I said, yes. And everyone else had said, no. They said, it's impossible. So he went out and he swam around the, the peninsula. It took him 13 days, but he managed to do it. And when he finished, he said, can I now go and swim at the North Pole or in the Arctic where the temperature is north to 5 degrees centigrade? And I said, I can't guarantee that you'll live. However, fortunately, there's a picture of him diving in. We were able to have him swim successfully in the Arctic and in the Antarctic. And this is what we're measuring here is his temperature response as he swims. And you'll see his temperature drops very little actually during the swims, and it drops mainly afterwards. And this was a swim of one mile at Deception Island, and then you can see his body temperature dropped quite dramatically near the finish. And he was absolutely at the limit of his abilities. And this is his muscle temperature, which is much lower. Notice this is 32 degrees centigrade. And even an hour and a half after getting out of the water, his muscle temperature was still 32 degrees centigrade. So he was just a warmed up body centrally, but his legs were still absolutely cold. To give you an idea of how tough that was. And here he is swimming essentially five years ago at the North Pole with a picture of the South African flag. Now the final topic is the one that's going to keep me going for the next 20 years, is are low-fat diets healthy for you? <laughs> <laughs> and where does it come from? 1977, the American Senate decides that we must change our diet and we must cut out all the fat and we must put lots of carbohydrate in. And that report was written by a vegan who had no training in nutritional <laughs> sciences. <laughs> And so this is what happened to your beautiful breakfast. And I must just tell you that those eggs are one of the most nutritious foods you can possibly eat. And what's the evidence against it? There's lots. But let me tell you, the French who do very well in terms of their hearts, they do everything wrong as far as their diet is. They eat far much more saturated fat. But we now realize that there are populations that eat much less fat in the diet and have much more heart disease than these populations down here, which eat a lot of fat and have very little heart disease. And so the concept that heart fat causes heart disease is completely bogus. And finally, it's been realized, so there's a paper, a meta-analysis, and that's an analysis of all the studies that have ever been done. And what it shows is this, that there's no evidence that your dietary fat is associated with heart disease whatsoever. So if you're scared of eating fat, you may now stop. Get rid of that scared, here's the evidence. That for that case. And so what happened, unfortunately, as we went through this was that it took us millions of years to get to that and 27 years to get to that. And this is directly related, I can tell you, to the increased carbohydrate and processed foods we're eating in our diets. So finally, my summary, challenging beliefs. What I've learned in life is that 50% of what we teach is wrong. The problem is we don't know which 50% it is. <laughs> <laughs> and it's our job as educated people is to spend our lifetime trying to figure out which 50% is which. <laughs> and until it's disproven, accept that for which the evidence appears solid and logical and is free of covert or overt conflicts of interest. Because unfortunately, industry is driving what you believe in many, many things. But don't ever dismiss lightly that for which there's credible evidence. That's reverse gullibility. And there's such clear evidence that the diets we're eating today are horrendous and we need to change them. We shouldn't be ignorant of that. Question everything else. But eventually the truth has to prevail. It always prevails. And so aim to be on the side of the truth. Thank you very much for your attention.